I think as astronomers we know that our Earth has existed for 45 million centuries and that we are the outcome of four billion years nearly of Darwinian evolution from the first simple organisms to the biosphere of which we're a part. But this century is special. It's the first in the 45 million centuries that the Earth existed when one species, namely ours, can determine the planet's fate. That's because we are so dominant, we're so numerous, we're having such a big effect through our technology on the environment and on the climate and on natural resources that what we do this century will determine whether the planet and our species has a bright future or not. This is a big challenge for us all. And I think astronomers are perhaps especially aware of this because most people who are happy with the idea of Darwinian evolution tend to feel that somehow we humans are the culmination of it all. But no astronomer could believe that. Because astronomers know that although we've uh, taken these four billion years to emerge, it'll be more than six billion years more before the sun runs out of fuel and flares up engulfing the inner planets. So we may not be even a halfway stage in evolution. Far more wonderful, far more complex entities may develop from humans here on Earth and far beyond. Maybe organic, maybe electronic, we don't know. So we are the stewards for a special century which will determine whether those marvelous developments can happen or whether they are all foreclosed if we mishandle developments on this planet this century. That's why we are living at a very special time and in a very special place. Technology, of course, has advanced hugely and has made life better for most people in the world in terms of health, food, communications and all that. It's amazing the transformations we've seen. And it would not be possible for the present world's population of more than 7 billion to survive at all without modern ways of growing food and without all the other technologies we depend on. Now the world population is going to go even higher. It'll be almost certainly 9 billion by the middle of the century. And let's hope that the uh, poorer parts of the world will catch up uh, with the uh, more developed areas like Europe and the United States. Um, but this is going to put big pressures on the um, environment and on ecologies generally. And there's a risk that it'll not only cause irreversible climate change, but also that it may uh, lead to mass extinctions. There have been in the history of uh, uh, our planet, five great extinctions, um, and we may be triggering a sixth. And to quote um, a modern great ecologist, E.O. Wilson, if human actions lead to extinction of many species, it's the sin that future generations will least forgive us for. I'm certainly a technical optimist. I think we already have the technology to make the world much better for those who are now disadvantaged. And the new technologies will enable us to do far more. But of course, as technology gets more powerful, its benefits get greater, but also there's a more serious downside if things go wrong. And the reason that coming decades, the rest of this century are going to be so challenging is that we will have to cope with the wide knowledge of these technologies and make sure that they're used for good and not used by error or by design in a damaging way. And it is a serious concern for me because uh, it's very hard to control how these technologies are used. It's not like building a hydrogen bomb which needs very large special purpose facilities and you can uh, monitor that and inspect places where this might happen. But the technologies for cyber attacks and for producing bio uh, weapons and pandemics 
these are widely spread and involve the same laboratories which are used for benign purposes in universities and industry. So what worries me very much is that these powerful technologies might be misused by error or by design. As I like to say, the global village will have its village idiots and some will have a global range. And to guard against these real disasters, which could be caused just by a few people, I think it's going to be a real challenge to governance and lead to growing tension between liberty, freedom and privacy. Well, I think it's one very important thing that we can all do, and that's to realise that uh, politicians normally focus on things which are urgent and short-term and which affect their locality, their constituency or their, their country. Whereas the things that we have to worry about now are long-term and they're global. Climate change is the most obvious example of this, but there are others. And so it's very hard to persuade politicians to uh, do something which will benefit people in a remote part of the world 30 years from now. They care about the immediate things, what happens before the ne next election. But what politicians do care about is what's in their inbox and what's in the press. And therefore, what we can all do as individuals is to raise consciousness of these concerns and if, like me, you're a university teacher, you can uh, make sure students are aware because they'll be alive till the end of a century. And I think if we can ensure that these topics are higher on the agenda, people talk about them more, then there's more chance that politicians will make decisions which will be optimized for the long term and not just for the short term. And in this connection, I think the world's great religions have a role. I'd like to highlight in particular the effect of the papal encyclical, uh, which came out in the summer of 2015, a few months before the Paris conference that led to a consensus on what might be done to alleviate climate change. Um, the um, uh, papal encyclical, of course, had huge influence on people and politicians in Latin America, in Africa and East Asia, not much in the American Republican Party, unfortunately, but it had a big global influence and the Pope got a standing ovation at the UN. And this, I think, was a very wonderful statement. Um, I'm interested in this because the scientific input actually came from the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, of which I'm a member, uh, which had high-level conferences in the year 2014, uh, which I think were important inputs into making this papal document something which was based on good science. And I think that's an example of how uh, science gets through through a billion people. Because whatever you think about the Catholic Church, you can't doubt its global range, its long-term vision, and its concern about the world's poor. Okay.